My name's Adrian Hayes. I'm a Brit, as you can probably sound. And I've got many different working hats. Uh, I'm most known for my extreme adventuring. I like to call them long camping trips across deserts, jungles, mountains, ice caps, and all the rest around the world. I'm a keynote speaker, a public speaker. I'm a coach, consultant, facilitator, mentor on leadership, on team development, executive coaching, and that side of things. I've done a few documentaries. Uh, I'm a social commentator on British television. Uh, I And I'm a campaigner for several subjects, including environmental, economic, and social sustainability. Okay. And just as an aside, I did not know who you were, I'm sorry to say, until yesterday when there was a clip of you talking on GB News, talking uh, very sanely about the climate alarmism and stuff. I totally loved it. So I'm uh, happy that you were able to get on here and uh, talk about this. Nobody knows who I am. It's a, <laughs> in, in the adventure world, that there's, uh, it's a very, it's, you know, so many things have been done. Like in the old days, the, the icons of the adventure world were very well known. No, there's, um, I don't expect to, to, to be known, but, uh, but I won't take that personally, Tom. But the elevator pitch for you is you've been to both poles and Everest, right? <laughs> yeah, I uh, climbed Everest, trekked to North Pole, South Pole, length of Greenland, climbed K2. And in two weeks' time, I'm off to climb the world's third highest mountain, which you won't know, and nor will pretty much any of your listeners. But it's uh, it's in the pool. It's called Kanchen Jungle, the world's third highest mountain. Um, and previous, I'll just mention my my previous experience. On um, I left school at sixteen with five GCSEs, adventuring around the world. So that's been integral to my life right from sixteen. I was doing about six or seven years. Decided let's get paid for this. There's got to be a way of getting paid for this. So I joined the British Army, two years in a special forces regiment. Then I joined the Gurkhas. Went to Sandhurst and joined the Gurkhas, the Nepalese mountain troops. Did that for, uh, I was in the army total about 10 years, and then went back to university, studied for MBA, went into business. I was selling Airbuses, Airbus aircraft in Middle East and West Asia for seven years. But but my key hook was was really getting into the world of personal development and coaching and leadership development, getting into that, wanting to do some really big adventures, which I've been continuing through my life. And and so I started off as a, um, as, as a professional venture for 11 years, as a speaker and a consultant coach. And that's how that got into. And then, which we'll speak about in a minute, I got into the world of sustainability and various causes after that. So what I'm gonna speak about today is net zero or sustainability, a critical thinking perspective. Okay, now let me say right from the start that I'm a passionate environmentalist. Look, I, as anyone who really does the adventuring world, you know, I, I'm I'm passionate about the world's extremes, the beauty and nature, and this is a real integral part of my life. So I'm passionate um, uh, environmentalist. I'm not a climate change denier. In fact, I'm going to come to this uh, in in a second. Um, but I'm not a scientist. I'm not a scientist. And one of the critical things you face when you, you speak to people, well, what do you know about these things? Well, I'm not. I said I'm not a scientist, but I am a critical thinking specialist. I'm an expert on risk. I'm an expert on objective setting and an expert on this thing called trade-offs. And it's that what I bring into this whole uh, element on net zero, as well as a lot of other things. When I do my social commentating, I'm really, really thinking from a big picture, critical thinking perspective and not just following the agenda and narrative. So that's where I come from. And one of the things on, on critical thinking Look, a lot of your answers, Tom, will probably be well on board with what you preach and what I'm going to say, but some may disagree. And what I say, I've got a mantra uh, I learned a few years ago, um, which is the 10% rule, which is that every person, every idea, every stance, every opinion, every viewpoint is at least 10% right. And when you accept that viewpoint, it, it does two things. Firstly, it forces you to actually listen, you know, listening to people. You know, active listening is a skill with 75% of people in the world don't actually have, but it actually forces you to listen and find areas of agreement that you could actually work on. And secondly, it stops that all too common labeling, you know, climate denier, ex-apologist, why, um, why denier or anti this or far right, far left, you know, communist, but all these labeling that we've on the big one, of course, conspiracy theorists, you know, on all these things, it drives me around the bend. If people actually listen, they will find they'll, they'll actually uh, agree with a lot more what I say than disagree. So um, that's the sort of introduction. Now I've got to start with, I've got the first video, which Tom, you can show. A 
Okay, so it's Friday the 1st of May. How are we going to climb that? <laughs> So that's 30 seconds of, of my adventuring working out. I hope you enjoyed that. Now, before I get into the whole world of how I got to the, the world of climate change and net zero, I want to share a slide, which is every few years, the Economist Intelligence Unit, the EIU, survey about 400, 300, 400 CEOs of multinationals around the world. And they always ask them, what, what are you missing in the workplace? What are you missing from your directors, from your leaders, from your managers, from your staff? When I first saw this, 2019, I was quite blown away because the number one issue that they found they wanted with their staff, all levels, was problem solving. Number two was teamwork. Number three, critical thinking. Number four, communication. Number five, leadership. So this is 400 CEOs across the world of what they want. Um, there's the source. And when I think about this, it's pretty much what we need on our expeditions. And I think it's a pretty good framework for what we need in the world. But the three things I'm going to really bring in today is this, the problem solving, the critical thinking, and the leadership, because I think these skills are lacking. We're diminishing it in our world today. And I think we need to keep this to the forefront of all our thinking as we go forward. So let's get into the world of climate change. How did I first observe? I've been climbing mountains since I was about 16 or 17 years of age. That was Everest. I climbed that in 2006. That was K2, which climbed second attempt in 2014. And the first thing was when you climb, when you go to anywhere, and if anyone's been to mountains like Mount Kenya or Kilimanjaro, you see the glaciers have shrunk. Undoubtedly, it's one of the most visible signs of a warming planet. The glaciers used to run for kilometers or miles further down the valleys, and they're now shrinking. So this was the first experience. But it was when I went, did my three major polar expeditions, which I started in 2007. This is when I visibly first saw the effects of climate change. Now, that is looking at a picture, a slide looking at the three ice caps of the world. On the left is the North Pole, the North Pole ice cap, the Arctic ice cap, Greenland slightly below it. And on the right side is the Antarctic ice cap. And it was, it was very timely because in 2006, Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth came out. And he went up to the Arctic and showed the melting ice and all the rest of the things. And we, it sort of woke up the world that this is a huge problem. And walking to the North Pole, just on our expeditionary side of things, it's only been done by about 150 people in history, starting with Admiral Robert Peary back in, 2000, in 1909. Peary claimed he reached the North Pole from walking from Canada but there was another guy, Frederick Cook, also an American, that also said, no, we didn't get there. I got there a year before in 1908. Now, from I'm sorry to your American audiences, but from us polar explorers' point of view, neither reached the North Pole. They got pretty far, Peary uh, in particular, but they didn't. Their, their distances they were covering was, was quite impossible to do. It got close, so full credit. But in fact, the credit, I think, for the first person, I think most polar explorers think the first person to actually get to the North Pole was, was um, oh, Plaisted in 1968. Can't remember his first name now. Did it by motor scooters. But regardless, the interesting thing is when Frederick Cook uh, mentioned about going to the North Pole, he reported ice blocks and ice uh, ridges and ice pressures about four to five meters in thickness. Now, this is what it was like in 2007, walking to the North Pole across a frozen ocean. The difference between those three ice caps is Greenland and the Antarctic rise to about 2,000 meters, 2,500 meters, um, in, uh, actually 3,500 meters, um, which in, in, dis in feet is 11,000 odd feet in height. The Arctic ice cap reaches about a meter and a half, okay, three feet. Why? Because it's sea ice. And this is my teammates, Canadian Richard Weber, one of the world's finest polar explorers, and my British teammate on the right, Ian Morpeth. Now, global warming or not, the biggest challenge walking to the North Pole is because it's sea ice, you've got to do it in early spring. If you do it in summer, you're going to be walking on water, and there's not many, too many people in history have actually walked on water. If you do it in the middle of winter when it's freezing cold or absolutely brutal, you'll be going in darkness. So you do it in early March. But it was still, we went one night, we went down to minus 60 in temperature, minus 60 degrees Celsius. Tom, you can tell me what that is in Fahrenheit. 
but it's bloody cold. Let's put it like this. Um, and so uh, this was a real brutal, brutal experience um, uh, of just surviving at these temperatures. But as it warmed up and as you go away from the coast of Canada, you get to experience and you get down to minus 30. I think it's minus 42 Fahrenheit. And you start to see the ice is breaking up. OK, now, this was a, a nice little break. And you can see there the ice is now about a meter, meter and a half thickness, half of it on top, half it below, like an iceberg. And so you had a, a lot of these. Some of them were about a foot in width, like we, we did there. Some were a meter. We had we we had a, a, a lot of difference. But but the dip, because it's so thin, the ice is all breaking up. And you've got to cross this stuff, pulling this massive, heavy sled, pulling your sled over this sort of things. But when it comes to the ice, it's what they're called. Sometimes you had it, it would all come together and you'd say, thank you very much, because it's all moving and shaking about and all like, like it's an ocean. Sometimes it would just drift apart and you'd have to walk about 10 miles to get around it, 20 kilometers, something like that. And sometimes, or once in particular, we actually had to swim. I don't recommend this to your listeners and viewers because it was rather extreme. Now, I'm obviously in my speedos getting ready to go in. It was about minus 42 at this at this stage, but, but a, a totally you know, crazy circumstance. That's about 5,000 meters in depth at that stage. But we were stranded on an ice island to get across this uh, this whole thing. But eventually, after 50 days from Canada, the hardest experience I've ever had, the hardest expedition I've ever had in the world, we got to the North Pole. Um, there's nothing there. There's no flag. There's no Starbucks. There's no welcome sign. Nothing. Because it's all moving. And in fact, when we were picked up by helicopter, we, we'd moved about... Um, I don't know, about 10 Ks of 10 kilometers, eight miles or so we move from the pole because it's such moving, but but an absolutely brutal, brutal expression. One of the proudest things I've ever, ever done. Now, when it comes to the Arctic on the climate change thing, we've all seen the graphs of, of, of the melting ice cap. Um, and it is the biggest sign of global warming uh, on earth, the whole of the Arctic, but this is the actual Arctic ice sheet and it's, it's decreased in circumference over many, many years. Of course, what these satellite images can't tell is how the, the, the depth has decreased, but those pictures um, do. And of course, the polar bear has become the poster boy or poster girl of the climate change movement, which I'll come back to in, in, in a little while. Now, the same year, uh, 2007, I went to Antarctica to attempt to cross, I was a bit of a role, that said, let's try and walk to the, the South Pole. Now, the variables on the sub, on the North Pole, you've got so many variables that can disrupt your whole expedition, mostly the moving ice cap, the brutal cold, the pressure ridges, the ice and all this. On the South Pole, you haven't got that problem. By the way, it's the most amazing place on Earth I've ever been, and I recommend everyone. It's one of these tick lists to do the 100 things you must do before you die. It's absolutely incredible. This was on a ship I went back a few years later. But walking to the South Pole, <clears throat> it's... um. Far less variables. It's a flat ice cap. There's a lot of sastrugi, what they call pressure ridges, but far lower than in the North Pole. And and basically, that's what you're doing, pulling this enormous sled or two sleds in this in this case across an ice cap. And there's not much to see apart from the sky, the sun, the ice, and your teammates ahead of you. Um, but the biggest single problem on the ice cap was on Antarctica was the wind. It's the most windiest continent on Earth. And when you got a 60 mile an hour, 100 K winds in your face the whole time, uh, it can be pretty, pretty tough. Two years later, but but on the climate change side, you don't see anything because you, you're on the ice cap. You don't see anything that's, as I said, three and a half thousand meters in depth or two miles, two and a half miles uh, in, in uh, imperial measurements. Two years later, in 2009, I went across the, the third ice cap of the world, which is Greenland, the world's largest island. And, and when you look at a, a map from the, from the top, it's amazing how far south the Greenland stretches. You've got this ice cap that predates from historic times that stretches as far south as Iceland, as mid-levels Norway, Sweden, Finland. Um, and you can see Great Britain in, in the side and Canada and Alaska, of course, uh, there as well. Um, and what we were trying to do was an enormous journey. This one hadn't been done before, was a south to north crossing using kites because it's too far. It's about three and a half thousand, two and a half thousand, three and a half thousand kilometers, two and a half thousand miles. And that's what we're trying to do south to north and then to northwest to a, a, a place called Karnak, which is near, very near Thule Air Base, which is an American Air Force base um, up in northwest Greenland. 
That's how we do it. It looks great fun. But uh, in those sleds, 130 kilograms were in those sleds. You are carrying a lot of weight, mostly two major ingredients, food and fuel. A lot of people say, is it water? No, you've got an ice cap beneath you, um, which, you know, three and a half thousand meters. But if you don't have the fuel to melt it, uh, you're a fat lot good. But there's no room, you know, weight is critical. There's no room for books or uh, Game Boys or Xboxes or hair dryers or curling tongs or all these luxuries in life, you know, really is down to the bone, down to the wire of what you carry. Now, very interesting on this, when we were doing this, I was introduced because at the same time as I started doing these uh, uh, polar journeys, I've been to the Arctic many years ago, but full-scale polar expeditions, I was introduced to the world of sustainability and uh, from, a, from a colleague on a leadership program I did in 2008. And it, this got word of, and we were introduced to um, one of Denmark's senior glaciologists, Dr. Sebastian Mernild. And I spoke to Dr. Sebastian a lot before Greenland. And he asked us to do what I'm picture doing here, take ice core samples, um, in fact, the depth of the ice every day, and then digging a meter down to there to, to weigh, weigh the ice there to, to check the density. So basically, this is all for the modeling on one of the previous COP conferences to see how much of the melting green ice cap, which is the greatest uh, cause of, of rising sea levels in the world, how much was being replaced by precipitation. And that's what this modeling will help to put them in for COP9. Um, it did get pretty hot on the ice cap, I can tell you. you know, I wasn't just flexing my abs there. I mean, it was absolutely, you know, anyone who's been skiing will know when it's, when it's hot sunshine, it can be really warm. So we had this uh, for many days where we couldn't kite, absolutely stillness, and we, we just had to stay still or just walk to the bottom. But we went to some um, amazing place. This is the top of Greenland, which only a handful of people in human history have ever been to, Piriland. And we were, our, our attempt was to get down to the Arctic Ocean as part of the first phase to finish. And it was then that we really discovered well, what, how much water runs off uh, a, a melting ice cap in, in the summer months, increasing summer months of 2009. So I'm going to introduce a video too here, Tom. Though Hayes and the team soon saw how man is spoiling it, inadvertently. The idea was then we'd, we'd put our camp there, we'd just go with backpacks and skis just to, to trek down the glacier um, to as far as we could get to the ocean then come back up. We thought it would be a pretty uh, simple trip, you know, it wasn't far, 15 kilometres back, but uh, it uh, ended up slightly more uh, dangerous than we, than we planned. We were walking through marshland, just sinking and getting soaked to the skin, and we suddenly thought, is this a good idea to come down here? Having experienced Greenland's environmental problems firsthand, they decided to seek firmer ground at camp. And this is where we experienced that. And then after we came back uh, from the top of Greenland, we had to trek or ski about 600 miles to the northwest of Greenland. This was at the end of our trip after 67 days, uh, a pretty battered sled and a pretty battered body. So that was my introduction to climate change, global warming, and the world of sustainability. And I'll say right from the start that, that there's no denial that the Earth is warming. And there's the, some of the indicators that we've got, you know, snow cover, glaciers, temperature of land, sea temperatures, all these things show that the Earth is warming. OK, so I'm not a climate change denier by any means. And I learned a lot from Dr. Sebastian and what I've read over the years about climate change. What the one thing he did say, and it always stuck with me, is there are many, many variables that cause our climate to change. Many, many, many variables. So let me put this then, let me introduce, park uh, climate change for a second. Let me introduce the world of sustainability, okay, which I, so I got into it also um, from a American woman, Ariane Burgess, who's now a Scottish men member for Parliament for the Green Party. And she introduced me to this, and she's a very powerful woman. And um, and I think my, my, my take on sustainability, it is the most overused 
yet misunderstood word in the English language today. Everybody says we got to be sustainable, sustainable development, sustainable procedures, sustainable policies, and nobody knows what it means. This is the crazy thing. Uh, it's just a, a word that's banded about everywhere. Now, what it isn't is the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 SDGs. Now, from my other working hats as a, as a coach, just looking at these as goal settings alone, they're not goals. No poverty. I mean, goal. if you look at goal setting from the Stephen Covey um, acronym uh, alone, SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, real, and time-bound, they're not, they're not goals. They're, they're dream lists. They're wish lists. Um, so they're not that. So what is sustainability? Well, it's three things. It's our economy, it's our society, and our environment. But the key principles of sustainability is everything we do in our lives on Earth fall into one of these three pillars, okay? But they are inextricably linked. What we do in one will affect all three, and you cannot solve problems in any one pillar without looking at the whole system together. That is sustainability right in the middle. And people don't seem to get this. So here's the two quotes that sum this up. We live in an operate in an inextricably linked system. Everything that we do in our economy will affect society, the environment, and vice versa. And we cannot sustainably solve problems in any one pillar without addressing the system as a whole. Okay, clear, simple, if it wasn't so simple. But the other thing, when you take the other thing, you can't solve problems in one pillar without taking everything as a whole, is this universal truth that there's no simple or single solution to any problem in our societies, our environment, or our economies. Everything is a trade-off. Everything is a trade-off. And I want people to remember, listening to this, to remember this as we, as we go through. So, how coming back to climate change, and not just climate change, but net zero, how does net zero now fit into this universal truth that is sustainability? Well, um, the science. Now, one stands to be corrected or shot down if you claim to be a scientist and give scientific arguments. There is a, 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 a different scientific consensus out there which the film, which I've watched on last week, Climate the Movie, adequately proved. But you are down. I've seen on Twitter some people countering this, so I don't claim to be a scientist and do this thing. I think the fact that carbon dioxide is such a small, and this really shakes people up when you ask them how much is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. People think, oh, it must be 30%, 40%. No, it's 0.04%. 0.04% is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the other interesting thing is 97%, this is not theory, it's not opinion, this is fact. 97% of that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is comes from nature. So with my critical thinking perspective, as, as, as we went on, and I used to, to campaign on climate change and sustainability, but over the years, I became a little bit critical thinking, thinking, a hmm, little bit skeptical, how... How can this, and when I then read there's been no peer-reviewed scientific experiments that have conclusively defined that carbon dioxide is a cause of global warming, all right? So that's number one thing. The second thing is when you look at historic temperatures over the, the last 2,000 years, last 200 years, the millennium, all these things, you look at these graphs. Now, again, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to put these things because someone will show the correlation between carbon dioxide and temperatures. But I, I do think the last 2,000 years in particular is the most relevant because some people say, well, like, you know, that's why the dinosaurs died off thousands and thousands and millions of years ago. But look at the 2,000 years we've had and the medieval warming period. We've had cooling periods. And this was oblivious, this climate change up and down, up and down, oblivious to, to carbon dioxide levels. So there is a, a, an alternate science. But of course, as the film Climate, the movie said, the, the alternate scientists have been sort of... Um, demeaned, cancelled, shut up, or, or, or told not to speak out. But I think what really, putting the science aside, is how the climate movement or how the net zero movement has sort of progressed, particularly in the last five years. We now have what I would say, and this is just stop oil in, 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 in London, I, I just think we've it's, it's turned into a sort of a quasi-religion. It's become a cult. It's become well-meaning individuals, and they want to save the planet, and they're petrified 
because of what they've been fed to by the media and politicians, that this is the greatest challenge on our life, on our, on our earth. And so we, we've had this to start with. But we've also had, again, critical thinking perspective, which I want everyone to, to remember. We've had the demonization of flying. You know, flying's bad for you. and That's terrible. And you're meant to apologize for flying and car driving. But that things are also conveniently forgotten, like data. Hmm, data, which even on carbon emission side of things, if you take carbon emissions to be a problem, which I don't necessarily think it is, but if you take that to be the main cause of global warming, carbon emissions are reported to be, will be about 25% of all carbon emissions by the year 2040. But does anyone talk about stopping smartphones or stopping or ceasing our data? No, flying is the, is the big thing here. Then we have the alarmism. This is the weather forecast. This was Europe two years ago where we had the hot... You know, the, the same temperatures that we've had sort of years ago and climate, the movie speaks about the 1930s. I can remember the, the summer of 1976 in the UK, but the colors have changed. We've got, I mean, I don't know what that's over the Sahara. Is that black? Is that cindering? Is that incarnation? I don't know. It's just, but this is what the, the media, again, weather forecasting has shown. And then for the, the third video I'm going to put in is a, a, a study from, or the work of Bjorn Lomborg. Uh, climate consensus based in, in Copenhagen, very, very powerful character and speaks a lot of sense. When, he, again, he says, look, climate change is happening. It's real. We've got to solve it. But he bemoans, he criticizes the alarmism that comes uh, out of the media and politicians these days. And that's the third video I want to show now, Tom. All the ice is going to melt. The trees will die and fall down. Countries will be underwater. We're scared that it's going to happen quite soon. Okay, so we are creating this world that children, climate anxiety, we got petrified children, uh, which the video showed. And, and I, I'm thinking to myself, this is again the last five years, hold on a second, hold on. What are we trying to do here? Why are we creating this alarmism for something, and as Bjorn Lomborg says, something we've got decades to resolve. Now, some people may disagree with that, may say the tipping point now, but but the effects of climate change is not going to be a sudden asteroid striking the Earth. It's going to take many, many years to actually really feel the effects. We've got decades to solve it, which Lomborg comes to the solutions, which I come to at the end of this presentation. Um, and then, again, along with this sort of critical skepticism, increasing skepticism about the narrative and agendas behind it, zero. I, I started to look at, you know, what, what, look at the world as a, a, as a whole. You know, we face many, many risks in our world today. And uh, here's one list. There's been many lists over the world. This was done by the Commission for Human Futures. It's a body of ex-prime ministers, various leaders, and they came up with this a few years ago. This was during the COVID eras. Climate change, environmental de uh, decline and extinction, nuclear weapons, resource scarcity, food insecurity, dangerous new technology, Overpopulation, chemical pollution, pandemic disease, denial and misinformation. And I think most people in a neutral stance would look at that and say, you know, yeah, I think they're all challenges we have to face. So I'm not criticizing any of that. There's the source. Um, I do think number 10, denial and misinformation. I've got a bit of a suspicion about that one. I remember Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission. You know, all the challenges we she spoke to I went to a conference a few months ago and said and said the greatest challenge we face on Earth. It's not Ukraine. It's not uh, it's not uh, anything else. And you know all these things. He said it's misinformation. I thought whoa. So I think half the misinformation is coming from the world today is from governments itself. But that's my own personal opinion. But I put I, you know I I went when I first saw this again a few years ago during COVID. I, I looked to myself. I looked to myself. Well, you know what are the risks we face? And here's my own risks. You know. It's not trademark, but there you go. Asteroid strike. Don't look up the film with Leonardo DiCaprio came and all this. It's solar flares. Now, solar flares and wiping out all the internet and data on our world. That could be a pretty serious problem. Nuclear weapons, it's in there. Bio warfare, not mentioned on the other list. I think that's a pretty serious problem. Superpower war is always there. Resource depletion. Come back to these in a minute. Hmm. Food security, water resources, energy resources, pollution. 
And there's some more overpopulation. I've got it in there. Um, biodiversity loss, deforestation, fish stock depletion, climate change. I put it in there. Pandemic disease, antibiotic resistance. I'll tell you what, antibiotic resistance. If if if, if this comes, it make the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, look like a common cold. Economic collapse, the debt we're facing in the world, the trillions of dollars of, of debt. I think it's $371 trillion. Unbelievable. Um, AI technology and humanity. But climate change, the, the whole point is, this is my own list, climate change is just one of these risks that we face in our world today. However, you wouldn't think this from the net zero narrative. And this is the problem that, I, that, that I've that i got. The net zero has gone totally on one risk, climate change, one variable, CO2, and one solution, net zero. And then coming back as a passionate environmentalist, I then say, well, hold on, hold on. What about all the other environmental? So I put the whole bigger risks of the world we face, but what about all the environmental risks we have? Because climate change didn't cause the pollution in our atmosphere that we have today. Not carbon dioxide, 0.04%, but sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, particle pollution, carbon monoxide, all these chemical nasties that are in the atmosphere, which are killing millions today. Now, the numbers are disputed. The UN reckons it's 5 million. Whatever you agree, it's killing millions, but it's mostly in the developing world. India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and a lot of Asian countries, where the air is so toxic that you you seriously, someone goes to Nepal in two weeks' time, and I know Nepal, Kathmandu, is one of the most polluted cities on Earth. So climate change didn't cause the air pollution. It didn't cause all the nasty chemicals in our lakes, in our rivers, in our seas, and in our oceans. Climate change didn't cause that. It didn't cause the human sewage contaminating our Again, our lakes, our rivers, our seas, our oceans. It didn't cause the plastic pollution that's blighting our seas, all the microplastics that's in our every in all our food chain. It didn't cause deforestation or the loss of, of forests and fields and bushlands and wetlands. Climate change didn't cause this. It didn't cause biodiversity loss. It didn't cause over uh, uh, fish depletion or fish stock depletion. It didn't cause habitat loss. It didn't cause any of these things. And I could go on and on and on. If I put a tweet up yesterday with all the things that climate change didn't cause. Climate change didn't cause 99% of all environmental issues on Earth. So, and what about the net zero solutions? EVs, electric vehicles, okay. Well, they don't, they don't emit any emissions. Of course, they're clean, great for the environment. But hold on, where do these things come from? The children mining cobalt and lithium and manganese in the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, this comes back to my thing on, on trade-offs. There's no trade And I think the figures for EVs where they, where they actually meet the total emissions and resource depletion of a normal petro combustion engine, it's about 150, 200,000 miles. Um, like wind turbines, all these great things, you know, clean source of energy. Uh, not quite. They don't last very long. Balsa wood from the uh, from the Amazon and all this stuff has got to be disposed of. I think it's a blight on the countryside as well. I detest them. And again, when the wind doesn't blow, they don't actually provide much energy. It's about 2% of energy uh, resources, energy supply in the UK. Solar power. Oh, fantastic. Where do the solar panels come from? From China. From the, the materials it creates, it costs to create a solar panel is extreme. Again, there's no cheap source of energy. There's always a trade offs. And again, we're blighting our countryside, destroying wildlife for these things. So th there's no single solution. And again, coming back from an passionate environmentalist compared to net zero, and I'm really the last five years have said, hold on, net zero is not about the environment. There's, far, there's all these other issues that are being ignored. And here's a, a, a simple slide that compare, compares them. Here's sustainability, here's net zero. Sustainability, multiple issues and mitigations, trade-offs on economy of societies, planting trees. Net zero, as I said, the single risk issue and unachievable, and it is unachievable by 2030, 2040. No impact analysis and the demonization of, of CO2. Sustainability and environment reducing pollution. 
sustainable consumption, sustainable population, net zero, high fuel and energy taxes, penalizing cars, expensive EVs, sustainability of the environment, regenerative farming, local food, sustainable products, net zero, meat rationing, insects for food, expensive, mand expensive mandatory tech. And the last one, you know, sustainable nuclear energy, which a lot of the green movements detest, but it's a clean source of energy, technological, uh, technological advancement, ex um, and experiences of travel, not stuff. I'll come back to a minute. Uh, net zero, ineffective work, wind turbines, social credit system, penalized flying. And you can't help, you know, look at the net zero movement and think, has this been captured? Has this been, is this an easy option for leaders to show that they're doing something? Can they, to create this, this, um, this problem, which is many years after they've left office, and they can claim they're doing something, the virtue signaling, and they can put it's easy to put in taxes, it's easy to penalize things, it's easy to, to sort of ban things all in the name of saving the planet. Far easier to far harder to solve some of the environmental problems that we've got um, arising today, like cleaning up our water, clean sanitation in the developing world, or getting the sewage out of water in the developed world, or actually the pollution in our waterways, or pollution or air. But of course, of course, on these things, there's no money. This is one of the things I've felt throughout the COVID pandemic and so many things, follow the money, money, power, and control. So the most controversial bit of this slide is, I think sustainability, people, planet, and profit, and a cleaner environment. Net zero, some of you may disagree, but profit, control, greenwashing, Neglect the environment and people. You know, some people may disagree on that, but it's becoming like this, this single risk, single issue, single variable and single solution alarmism that's been created. So what do we do? It's already well sort of pointing out the faults, you know. So going back from a sustainability perspective, okay? Everything we do in one pillar has an effect on the others and you can't solve problems in one pillar without looking at all three together. And the third one, that everything is a trade-off. Well, here's one of the greatest quotes of sustainability I know, which is harvest must not exceed, exceed regeneration. Waste must not exceed absorption. And this points to two things. It's a very good definition of sustainability. This points to two things, which is how much we consume and the subsequent waste and how many of us are consuming and the subsequent waste. This is the real inconvenient truth, not just of climate change and net zero, but of all our environmental issues on earth. How much we consume and how many of us consume. But here then, you know, and then now a lot of the green movements and uh, will say, we've got to stop consumption. We've got to, and, and basically we've got to stop consuming, but the, you know, there are trade-offs on this. I have to put this quote up again. No simple single solutions to solve any problems we face in society. Everything's a trade-off. And I'm full, I'm not a stuff fan. And I do think, and this is the positive side, younger people today are more looking for experiences than stuff. Okay, whether it's rock climbing, my local rock climbing is wall in Southampton, UK is packed solid with young people. Whether it's or whether it's visiting Machu Picchu or the Grand Canyon, or whether it's going climb Everest, or whether it's hiking, or all these things, or whether it's even the simple thing about having a coffee. Coffee shops are booming in the UK. They, you know, yet the markup's about 100, percent but it's it's very little impact on on our, our environment. So I think there's a positivity about more experiences and less stuff. And do we need to spend so much? And this is primarily a developing world problem. However, the trade-offs, there's millions, perhaps billions of people in the developing world who rely on us, you know, working in factories to produce garments or handbags or whatever. And that's their lifeblood that, that for what we consume they're producing. You take that away, how are they going to solve? How are they going to live? So again, it's that trade-off between consumption. How do we do this? To me, this is the harder one because in the developing world, they don't want to be told that you've got to decrease your consumption. They want to get consumption us and GDP growth up as much as, as we did. So, you know, this is a big, this is a, a, a serious problem trade-offs. I think the easier one is to reduce the number of us consuming. 
which is about that sustainable population growth. Now, let me tell you this and something, because it's taken a, it's, there's a lot of people now said a lot of articles out there saying the greatest challenge we face on earth is depopulation. This is bunk. This is bunk because when you have such a high baseline, which is 8 billion people and rising today, this year on this earth, even with the reducing birth rate, okay, there will still be 80 million extra mouths to feed on the earth this year, 80 million, a population the size of Germany. It will take decades and decades and decades, probably 100 years before population even starts to reduce. So we're looking at a, a population of, you know, probably around uh, 10 billion people. And this is probably the second greatest factor in our environment, in our environmental concerns, because every mouth, every human being needs to feed, needs to clothe, needs a house. This is where the habitat loss, the biodiversity loss, the deforestation, the waste, the resource depletion, this is where it comes to. Now, a lot of environmentalists, and as many say, you know, you can't, it's all very well for, for rich Westerners to tell African uh, women they can't have more babies. This, again, is bunk. I'm, I'm a patron both of Population Matters and a charity called Chase Africa. And the women in East Africa, they're op operating in East Africa, they're begging for family planning aid. They don't want to have um, babies. And it's, the, it's, it's where we need to educate people because, you know, big families are, are both a consequence of poverty, but also a cause of poverty. And so I think this is the easiest one to, to solve. And when it comes to the big, often aired argument in the last few years, you know, but who's going to pay the taxes to, to, to support our government spending on what we do? I'll tell you what the answer is, reduce spending. Stop wasting it on forever wars. Stop wasting it on net zero subsidies. Stop wasting it on mindless quangos on, on minority rights and gender equality, all this stuff, the waste that Western governments do and benefits. And you've got, it is, it's, it's astronomical, but we've got, again, many decades to get into reduce, to reducing our spending so we have a lower tax base, yes, but we don't spend so much. I mean, our debt, as I said earlier, is out of control. And finally, and I said right at the beginning that the 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 ten percent rule. I have a ten percent rule that every opinion, every stance, every viewpoint, every person is at least ten percent correct. And I would say to the net zero movement, you know, the the ten percent I agree on. Firstly, there's a passion about the passion about the environment, but I say, look, if net zero reduces the pollution in our airways, in our in our in our atmosphere, that is a good thing. So I'm not against renewables at all, but but reducing pollution is a very very different objective than cl for climate change. But yes, let's reduce pollution in our atmosphere of certain certain gases by 2030, 2040, 2050. When you set that objective, it's a very very different solutions. And I do think that nuclear energy, this is the small modular reactors, is the future to go by. And there could be hydrogen, lots of other things, but nuclear fusion uh, as well. Final slide. Um, and this brings in, goes back to net zero. This brings into my work as, as a leadership coach, as, as a team coach, executive coach. And one of the tools I said right at the beginning, one of the, the tools I, I speak about is objective setting. And we've, I, I quoted Stephen Covey's a SMART goal acronym, specific, measurable, achievable, real time bound. But there's a lot more to goal setting than that. Is it authentic? Is it credible? Is it staged? Is it sustainable? And there's a lot, there's another parameter of goal setting, which is about the trade offs, the impact analysis, cost benefit analysis, and all these things. And I think when I look at the world today and our leaders, I don't think anywhere near as concise, clear, defined um, analysis of objective setting is put in. Look at what happened on COVID and the lockdowns, and I'll make no excuse that you know there was no impact analysis. It was done from an emotional perspective, and we shut down economies. The effects would be would be uh, uh, realizing for decades to come on all these things. But the biggest quote I I put, and this is my final thing on goal setting, objective setting, is I ask and I ask this to leaders and senior management teams and boards around the world. I ask two questions. What exactly are we or are you trying to achieve here? I'll say it again. What exactly? Let me stress that word exactly. What exactly are we trying to achieve here by net zero? 
Now, the answer is we are trying to reduce, we get to net zero by 2040, 2050, 2060, whatever. Okay, that's the goal of net zero. Take it that. Okay. But the second question is this why? For the sake of what? Now, the answer will be because we want to reduce climate take, we want to limit climate increases to 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. Okay. Now, I can very much dispute this. We saw the modeling on COVID completely out. How climate scientists know exactly that if we reduce CO2 by this much, it's going to reduce temperatures by this or limit temperature increases. So I think there's a critical, there's a skepticism, but let's park it. Let's not, let me just accept it for, this, for, the, for, for now that that is the why for the sake of what? Third question why for the sake of what? Now, this is when you get into sort of bluffs and blunders and errs and ums and ahs. The climate change movement, net zero movement, say they want to save the planet. And I say, I've seen the power of nature firsthand when I've nearly died up on these big mountains or up the ice caps. You know, the planet nature will look after itself very well indeed. Now, maybe consequence on us, but the planet will save itself. So it's not that. So you can dismiss that one. And then they're saying, uh, well, it's to save lives. What lives? And well, it's all lives, they'll say. It's because climate change has no borders. Well, that's rubbish as well. I've lived in the Middle East for 20 years, and we get temperatures regularly up to 48, 49 degrees Celsius, whatever that is, so I'm in Fahrenheit, and we survive very well. You can build, you can survive anywhere on Earth or in space or underwater on Antarctica if you've got the money to pay for it. So it's not that. Well, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's poor lives. It's poor lives. Okay, so if the objective is to save poor lives, okay, poor lives in the developing world, why aren't we putting the trillions of dollars that we're spending on net zero into clean water and sanitation, which kills millions now? Tuberculosis, malaria, poverty. Or how about even the cold? Because the cold kills 10 to 20 times more people in the world today than heat does. You see where I'm going on this? Well, well, well they'll say, well, it's to, it's to stop rising sea levels. Okay, great, rising sea levels. Decades and decades to solve this for a relatively small number of people. Well, what about mitigation, right? What about sort of bar what the Netherlands did uh, and other countries? It's far cheaper to do that in the Maldives and Micronesia and all these places. Uh, blah, 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 blah. What about to um, to stop Im immigration? Because, people, yes, a very, very serious problem these days. But isn't that, again, should we be putting the aid to building up the economies, reducing the birth rates of, of developing countries, which the women... Of, of Africa are pleading for? Well, it's to clean up the environment. Yes, and as I said before, if that is the objective, and I'll say air pollution, if the objective is to clean up the air in our world, I am all for this. But it's a very, very different objective. And, 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 if you're going to clean up the air, how about clean up the waterways as well, and our land, and our refuge, and our waste, and all the rest of it? So you see what I mean? What exactly are we trying to achieve here? For the sake of what? Why, for the sake of what? And when you get that in mind, it sort of puts net zero into a, mm, because this all comes down to the cost and what we're doing and the trade-offs. What could this money be better used for? So, finish thing. Um, look, I'm, I'm passionate again about the world, and I've been very, very privileged to look at the world from a, a high picture perspective. This was picture was taken on the top of Everest of the world's fifth highest mountain, Mount Makalu in the, in the near ground. By the way, in the far distance on the left is Kanchenjunga, which I'm about to climb in, or hopefully climb, attempt in two weeks' time. But when you look down the world below, and when you struggle to get up there, you have a very different perspective. And as I said, I think we've got to take this whole bigger perspective of sustainability, of risk, of really objective setting, and really asking what we're actually trying to achieve. That's my presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I'm going to hand you back to Tom. My first question is uh, just coming out here as a passionate environmentalist, but you're speaking out against the whole CO2 thing. Uh, how much pushback are you getting or support in your world? Well, when I, I've done a few seminars recently, I've been speaking about this for, you know, literally since 2008. Um, I have become a bit more vocal because I can see the whole sort of, um, I can see the agenda narrative. Yeah. Some people you you disagree with the, 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 perhaps the more, passionate about uh, 
net zero. But a lot of people, and I've spoken to a lot of climate change activists, and they say, you know what, Adrian, I think you're right. We need to solve all of these issues, not just climate change. But here's where there's no magic money tree. That's where, you know, that's where we've got to take a, a balanced view. All right. So you have been speaking out a little bit against the whole climate narrative since uh, 2008, as long as ago as no, that. No, 2008. I, it was I was campaigning for climate change along with sustainability. I always said, look, there's a bigger picture. We can't just look at climate change. You've got to look at the whole picture. I think the last few years, I think I think the COVID narrative sort of really, you know, changed me. We just saw that modeling was correct, that the the greatest transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich in, in the pandemic era than, than in history. And you you start to become a lot more skeptical. And I'm looking at, at climate and net zero in the same vein as as pandemic um response times. Uh, and I, as I said, and I and I haven't even touched on, you know, the control and power and all these things. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's concerning me, if, as I said, it, you know, it goes back to the objective as well. And, and as I was saying earlier, I saw you on that two minute clip from GB News and I was just I watched it a couple of times. I was so happy to see that uh, in some sort of a mainstream type, type media. Do you, have you gotten a lot of pushback from that already in the last 24 yeah. hours? You know, and. and there are some people who deny the science. And this is why I said that there will be an alternate science view out there. Okay. Some people will forever claim that carbon dioxide leads temperature and all the rest of it. And they'll dispute that the solar activity. I mean, personally, I think that there's so many things. I, I think the best answer for science is we don't know. And I don't think any scientists know, but there are other reasons. But yes, so I've had some pushback, but a lot of people, a lot, and I think it's increasing. People are seeing through. The, they're seeing through the lines. Why? Why is this? Why is this such? What this alarm is? The WHO, World Health Organization, World Economic Forum, the elites, the globalist elites, Bill Gates. Sorry if any Bill Gates fan, but you know, preaches on climate change and flies on his twenty-six private jets around the world. Come on, you know, there's a bit of hypocrisy out there. I am curious from your perspective. So, uh, is GB News is that considered any sort of mainstream, or that's totally out of the mainstream? Or well, um, it? well, it's 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 a new kid on the block. It's come in with a free speech, um, critical thinking perspective. It's not the only one. There are other channels in the UK. Talk um, Talk TV does the same, and they, you yeah. know, people call it right wing. By the way, if anyone wants to label me as right wing, they're going to be looking far. I'm not right wing, left wing, up down. I I'm anti political. I come from across the spectrum. Some of the things I speak about will be traditionally left-wing things, some things traditionally right-wing things. But it's been targeted to say right-wing channel. And I think this is wrong. I think this is we, we've got to get this. This is not about right-wing or left-wing or whatever. It's about common sense. It's about, you know, the, the what is best for our world and whatever political perspective, perspective you stand from. All right. Then my final question is unrelated to climate. It's just that uh, while you were talking, I looked up uh, you on Wikipedia and I found out how old you are. And I'm shocked that, that uh, you're doing this well. <laughs> uh, do you have any advice for the rest of us? So, like, what did you do to uh, to uh, maintain your uh, maintain yourself look, so healthy? What did you do? Look, Tom, I, look, I'm only 94, but, you know, <laughs> or I'm only 34. I just look old because I've had a hard life. No, I'm actually sixty. I'm actually sixty-five in a in a in a couple of months. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm an old man. But you know, look, I I I eat organic food wherever I can, and that's the whole thing. But also keep you know exercise and fitness. But I treat my body as a temple. You know, it's a bit of a ruined one. It's had some hard times, but uh, yeah, it just you know. And I just think again, we got to look at what we put into this. The only body I'll ever have. So I treat it like gold dust. But but thanks for embarrassing me to your millions of audiences there, and. I, Anyway, but there you go. But as I just, I'm, I'm thinking it's quite funny now because you know, just because uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm over the heart. And by the way, there's another quote I use, you know, which is, "You don't stop when you get old; you get old when you stop." I'm going to keep doing this stuff till I'm in my hundreds. I hope. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Any other points you want to make before we go ahead and wrap this one up? No, I think um, just on this thing about trade-offs, and it's really come to my mind, you know. And and I speak, I speak, I consult, I coach, I mentor on leaders around the world, senior people. And I think of all the qualities leaders need to show, I think when you're looking at these trade-offs, it's this not just sound judgment, but excellent superlative judgment. That is the quality, the number one quality I'm looking for in leaders. And I think it's fair to say that the leadership in the world today, in you know, in politics, in business, in globalist institutions is somewhat lacking compared to the past. And I think, you know, if I can do anything 
you know, and your audiences to get this whole thing of what makes real leaders. You know, that's that's my real passion as well. People, planet, and profit, not just profit alone. All right. Thanks a lot for doing this. I really appreciate having you on here and good luck in Pleasure. your next expedition there coming up in two weeks. Huh? Thanks, Tom. All, all right. The best. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye.